All right, it's Roland Jones. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy the uh, slideshow of basic the preference law. This is a course about 547 of the Bankruptcy Code, 11 U.S.C. 547, commonly known as the preference laws. And I'm going to I don't, I'm going to be going into why we have these laws, um, what elements a trustee needs to prove to succeed in avoiding a preference, and what the defenses are to a preference action. Basically, the law permits a trustee or another entity to avoid payments or transfers that were made pre-petition prior to a bankruptcy case and have those funds and assets returned to the estate. So why do we have these laws and, uh, and uh, how do they work? I've been defending preference cases for about 15 years now, over, well over a decade. Typical fact scenario is this. Uh, you do business with a company. May, maybe you know the company is in trouble. Maybe you don't. Uh, you sell them product or render services. They pay you. No problem. Everybody's happy. Then about two years later, you get a letter or a lawsuit from a trustee who wants the money back. Uh, but by the way, the debtor's estate gets to keep your products and your services. So what is this about? How, 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 could this, how could this happen? Most of my clients respond with uh, unrepeatable comments, um, and it's left to me to explain the reasons for a, a preference case. Before we go and look at the specific elements of the code section, what what is what is the basic problem? What, what are we trying to do here with these preference laws? What's the basic? Why do they exist? Uh, they seem unfair. They seem counterintuitive. Uh, what are we trying to What are we trying to solve? What problem are we trying to solve with these preference laws? I think the easiest way to look at this is that it's a party. It's a party that, that a lot of people are invited to, um, and the problem is. Some people get there early. So what's the advantage of getting there early? How's that relevant? Well, let's say, you know, four people show up early and uh, the hostess puts a, the, a nice pie on the table and these guys uh, split up the pie evenly and start taking pieces. Um, the problem is, it turns out that this is a much bigger party and 100 people show up an hour later and 100 people have to now divide up either half this pie or 75% of this pie into tiny, tiny slices. So some of these people that came later start to grumble and say, how come, how come these guys got huge slices where we had to look at tiny slices? It's not, not really very fair. And so, they, uh, and so they start complaining to the host, and the, and the host says, uh, look, look, they're really, you know, they're, there are a lot of people that have to divide up this pie. So I'd, I'd really like you to give back the pieces that you took so you know we could divide this up evenly so uh, nobody gets upset. Well, there are all kinds of issues that come up now. I mean, one guy says, well, what do you mean I have to give back the, my slice of the pie? Are you crazy? First of all, I already ate it. And why should I have to give it back? I didn't know there were going to be people showing up. It's your fault. Um, what if one of the guys came there purposely to get a big piece and he knew there were going to be a lot of people at the party and everyone finds out, uh, should he have to give back the pie? What if these four guys, what, what if there's no pie left at all? It's all been taken and there's nothing for these uh, 100 people that show up on time. Um, should the, it should, is that a stronger argument for having these guys uh, give back slices? What if only one slice was taken? So can we live with that and let everybody else divide up 75% of the pie? So there are a lot of issues that come up at this party. Well, if you substitute the host for a trustee, bankruptcy trustee or creditors committee, and you substitute the start of the party for the bankruptcy filing date, uh, you pretty much have a definition of what a preference callback is all about. What's interesting is that Preference callbacks are not really defined in the Bankruptcy Code. Uh, the Bankruptcy Code only defines certain transfers, certain payments that can be avoided 
taken back or not. Now, this is 547B. The trustee may avoid any transfer of an interest of the debtor in, part, in property, and it gives a it gives a sort of a laundry list of what the trustee has to prove so that he can he can avoid a transfer. This is 547C, and again, it just lists elements here that the trustee in situations that the trustee may not avoid uh, a transfer. It doesn't say that uh, trans transfers. Um, uh, that meet these criteria are not preferential. It just says what can be avoided and what cannot what cannot be avoided. The, the important takeaway is that there's no real definition of a preference or what is a preference. It's just a laundry list of um, factors that will compel the return of a uh, of a transfer or uh, allow an exception <clears throat> for for a transfer uh, not to be avoided. This is my own definition of what a preference is. Uh, it's probably a gross simplification, I'm sure it is. Uh, but it's like the party, any full payment to a creditor, a full slice, when the debtor is insolvent, uh, when there are a lot of demands on the pie and the debtor can't pay everyone a full slice, it's got to, the pie's got to be divided up a lot smaller, followed by a bankruptcy, um, start of the party. Okay, well, I sort of hinted by my story what the rationales are for the preference callback laws, uh, but I'm going to go into each one of them separately, and then we'll take a look. Do, this, do these laws uh, meet their goals, or... Do they need to be changed? Well, I kind of touched on this. So during the pre-bankruptcy period, the debtor's insolvent. He can't pay anyone in full. There's not enough money to pay any, everyone in full. And yet some guys are being paid in full. And it's not fair. And then when there's a bankruptcy filing, uh, the other unfavored uh, folks uh, get to split up what's left. So there's basic unfairness, and we're going to try to fix that. Uh, with the preference laws. That's basically what I just said. I mean, the theory, the theory, I, the theory ends up being very different from the reality. I did another video on that. But the theory is that, you know, some creditors are being paid 100 cents on the dollar, and we're going to take a close look at those guys and see if they were sweetheart deals see if they took action uh, out of the ordinary uh, to get an advantage during this chaotic uh, slide into bankruptcy period uh, because it's not fair to, uh, you know, most of the other creditors uh, that, that didn't take these aggressive actions or that weren't favored and are stuck getting paid uh, pennies on the dollar. So we're going to bring that money back and we're going to put it in the pot and redistribute that the money that was brought back from preference defendants, and and everybody, everybody's going to get uh, a fair shot, a fair equitable equitable distribution. This is a fairly recent case. I think it's a pretty good example of the principle of equality of distribution. Okay, well, the debtor was a private jet maker, actually in New Mexico even though uh, I, I assume it was incorporated in Delaware because that's where the case was decided, probably filed in Delaware. Um, uh, Prudential, in this particular situation, was in the business of providing relocation services. Uh, the jet maker apparently was never a great payer and way before the preference period, there were payment plans and adjustment to terms. Uh, what's interesting about this case is that Prudential found out uh, that the debtor was laying off, you know, hundreds of people. Um, it was clearly a trouble. It was laying off, you know, a huge amount of employees. And why did Prudential know? Because they're in the business of relocating all these guys. So the debtor would say, hey, we're laying off half our, half our company. Uh, why don't you relocate them? Um, and what happened was... Uh, Prudential said to itself, hey, this is 
this business is, is definitely in trouble. Uh, we better get paid. So it changed the terms of its uh, payment plan. It tightened up dramatically uh, and, and, and added a, a lot of pressure. It said it would stop relocating people unless the payment plan was changed. Uh, it demanded earlier payment, changed the terms. And this is reflected in uh, what actually happened um, you know, during the, during the uh, pre-preference period. It was getting paid uh, much slower. And, and then all of a sudden, during the preference period, it was getting uh, paid much faster. 45 days compared to 28 days, average days to pay. And uh, so the company, JetMaker, did go bankrupt. Prudential was sued. Uh, by the trustee and the court found, hey, you know what? This is exactly what we're trying to avoid here. Prudential, Prudential had an advantage. First of all, they had knowledge. Second of all, they had very, very uh, unusual pressure during the preference period, uh, apparently because of the knowledge, and they got and they got the faster payment. Um, so, uh, you know, they got paid uh, in full. Uh, whereas, uh, theoretically, uh, a bunch of other creditors uh, got pennies on the dollar after the bankruptcy. So uh, this was a case where Prudential lost, and uh, the judge said uh, the payments that it received would need to be relocated. The payments were reloca relocated back to the debtor. Again, this slide gives a little bit more detail but basically uh, what I just described. We don't want to reward creditors uh, from being aggressive at first to the courthouse. In other words, we don't want to reward them uh, for being first to the party. That's the opposite of what we want to do. And the preference laws in theory, you know, these creditors, these folks will know if they're aggressive while the debtor is insolvent right before bankruptcy, uh, they're going to have to give back the money anyway and go through a lot of hassle. Uh, so they're going to be less aggressive. Also, we want to discourage these guys because uh, maybe these troubled companies uh, won't need to file bankruptcy at all. Uh, so this sort of discourages aggression during this uh, chaotic, vulnerable pre-bankruptcy period and stops rewarding people from getting rewarded uh, for being first. The typical verbiage you'll see in a lot of cited in a lot of opinions is race to the courthouse. We don't want people racing to the courthouse. Um, and uh, what you need to know about this is that that's the, that's the standard law under state law. You're supposed to race to the courthouse. We live in a race to the courthouse um, uh, collection law uh, paradigm most of the time, except during the preference period. We don't want people racing to the courthouse. N not only not only um, to get ahead or be first to the party, but we don't want people taking chunks out of the debtor, putting liens, taking assets, siphoning off assets, dismembering the debtor prior to a bankruptcy filing. That's the whole point of the bankruptcy filing is to distribute these assets equitably. So we don't want people doing that. It's very, very different from what uh, the law normally encourages. Okay, the Richardson versus Wells Fargo Bank uh, is an example of conduct that we want to discourage and, and an example of why we want to discourage it. Okay, the debtor in this case was a processor of walnuts. Uh, so you go into a store and buy a pack of walnuts. So this is their business. They package walnuts and for retail sale. And so of course, um, well not of course, but in this case, they bought the raw walnuts from walnut growers. They had about 200 walnut growers uh, that grew walnuts. And you know, being a New Yorker, I just have no clue about any of this. I didn't even know they grow, I didn't even know they grew walnuts, but they do. Anyway, uh, one of the walnut growers shipped, you know, a bunch of walnuts uh, raw walnuts to the debtor, and the debtor ran into trouble because the opinion says that in the late 1990s, 
the market for walnuts all of a sudden decline. That doesn't make any sense to me either. Why would, why, why would people stop eating walnuts? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, they didn't pay, the debtor did not pay the, uh, one of the walnut growers and have about 200 growers apparently. And this particular walnut uh, uh, grower got fed up, uh, sued in state court and obtained a lien. Um, and this is during the preference period, unfortunately for that walnut grower. Uh, company files for bankruptcy, and there's a dispute with Wells Fargo Bank, who also had a lien on the assets of the debtor as to the validity of this lien and the extent of the lien. And basically the judge said, you know what, this is a perfect example of why the preference laws exist. We don't, we want to discourage uh, one creditor from being aggressive and getting, getting an advantage by getting a lien and uh, getting a big chunk of the debtor's assets. So what the judge did was say that, you know what, you don't even need to file a preference case, Mr. Trustee, I'm going to rule on this right now. And this is exactly what the preference laws uh, want to discourage. And I'm going to designate this as a preference. So that's a chart that sort of illustrates this fact pattern a little bit. So the theory is uh, one of these suppliers uh, raced to the courthouse to secure its claim and uh, it got an advantage over the other similarly situated growers because it was able to get a lien. And it was, if the lien was honored uh, post bankruptcy, it would have had a huge advantage over the similarly, similarly situated growers. And we, we certainly want to discourage that. So this grower is out of luck. And uh, it actually, it had a lean on the walnuts. It had a lean on, on, on the nuts. So the moral of the story is uh, don't grab someone's nuts in the preference period. This slide just summarizes again the case and emphasizes the race to the courthouse language, which is pervasive in, uh, in preference law. We want to discourage a race, a race to the courthouse for the reasons we described earlier. I'm going to, I'm going to stick this issue in over here because it's important. And it's also comes up a lot. Every time I got a client that sued for a preference, they're like, you know, Sergeant Schultz, if anybody remembers Hogan, Hogan's heroes, I know nothing. I didn't know there was going to be, uh, I was preferred. Uh, I didn't know there was going to be a bankruptcy. I know nothing. I know nothing. Unfortunately, it's not a defense because intent isn't required um, since the law, since uh, the 1978 bankruptcy code. Uh, again, uh, I make recommend, I, I have recommendations here that I, that I go into in another video, but that's the, that's the way the law is now. No intent is required. And in a way, it does make sense because uh, if you're getting paid while the debtor is insolvent, whether you knew, whether you didn't know, if you're getting paid while the debtor's insolvent, um, you're getting um, 100 cents on the dollar. And really, the debtor can't afford to pay everyone 100 cents on the dollar. So someone else is not getting paid because you're getting paid 100 cents. In other words, the debtor cannot pay everyone 100 cents on the dollar. So you're getting an advantage. And eventually, if there's a bankruptcy, uh, that advantage is going to be very, very clear. So it doesn't really matter whether you knew or not. You get to the party early, you take a big slice. You didn't realize a hundred people were going to show up. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but it's a very important concept that you're being preferred, even though there's no bad intent. I'm assuming you didn't know that a hundred people were going to show up. You didn't even know you were early. You just got a slice. Um, it's not your fault. It's not a plan. Uh, it's not a conspiracy. Uh, with you and the hostess, uh, you just happen to get a big slice, really by accident. But you are being preferred. You're getting an advantage. What's very important about this is that there's a lot of confusion um, as to the preference laws, and especially as to the, <coughs> excuse me, as to the defenses. Uh, a lot of people interpret the ordinary course defense as, "Oh, I, I didn't get a preference." It's not the case. These defenses just uh, create exceptions to the application of the trustee's ability 
to avoid the transfer. That's why the language is very specific. Doesn't mean you weren't preferred. You, you may well have been preferred, but we're going to make an exception. I included this case because uh, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but I'll try to explain it as well as I can. Okay, what happened here is that Bank of America had two loans, two liens on a particular piece of real estate. The first lien was fully secured, 100% secured, and the second, lien, the second lien was partially secured. What happened was that the debtor made a payment against the first mortgage. The end result of that is that it freed up collateral uh, that formerly uh, was being tied up by the first mortgage and made that collateral available to the second mortgage. So during the preference period, the second mortgage became more secured and less unsecured. So why is that important? The reason it's important, the reason it's a preference is because the second uh, debt, Bank of, Bank of America's second mortgage is now during the preference period, all of a sudden secured, whereas before it was unsecured. Uh, so it's not fair to other, other unsecured creditors because now Bank of America is getting paid in full and this change occurred during the preference period. The bank argued, well, we didn't know. We didn't have any intent to uh, get an improvement in our position. The debtor paid the first, the first mortgage and there happened to have been uh, automatically a result that the second lien became more secure, but we certainly didn't intend that. And the, the bankruptcy judge concluded, it doesn't matter what you intended. Intent is, intent is completely irrelevant. Um, you, you got a huge improvement during the preference period and it's preference. You've been, you've been favored. Who, well, who gives the right uh, to a trustee or a creditors committee uh, to sue me if I'm a if I'm a defendant in a preference case, uh, where do they where do they get that right? Where do they get the standing? This case uh, is an illustration of where they get the standing. Essentially, it has to be spelled out in a confirmed plan of reorganization. That's what confers standing on a trustee. In this case, the trustee was appointed, initiated preference actions, and the creditors argued uh, you, were, you weren't given any authority or proper authority or explicit authority under the debtor's reorganization plan. So who gives you the right to, uh, to sue us? And uh, the bankruptcy judge agreed with them. The bankruptcy judge essentially said uh, the plan must designate without any ambiguity who's going to be suing for preferences must identify the parties, must set forth a legal basis, um, and clearly state that the defendant will be sued following confirmation. As a side issue, what's interesting to me is that uh, none of my clients ever know that, they, that they're on a list and that they're gonna be sued because the plan and disclosure statement are about 800 pages of small print. And uh, it's not really very helpful to give notice to anybody. I'm sure this is, I'm sure this is stated on page, you know, 722 uh, in a footnote. But anyway, that's the law. The burden of proof, who's got the burden of proof to prove uh, avoidance or non-avoidance is a very important issue and it actually causes a lot of bitterness and I'll tell you why. Well, this is the code section that states who's got what burden. The, the problem is that the, the trust since 19, since the code changed, actually since the bankruptcy laws changed with the arrival of the bankruptcy code in 1978, uh, the trustee's burden of proof changed. The only thing the trustee has to prove are some fairly simple elements that are that are that are pretty easy to prove. I'll go into the elements later, um, but he doesn't have a big burden. The defendant, on the other hand, has got to prove uh, the elements of the defendant's defense. So you know, clients say, "Look, they can bring an action against me, and uh, I'm basically guilty 
uh, until I prove my innocence. Uh, that's not the way things should work in this country. And, and it, it, it kind of is like that. But what's the basic misunderstanding there is that, um, you know, if, if a defendant proves ordinary course or other defenses, then uh, there wasn't a preference. But of course, there was a preference. So you are guilty. You did get a preference. It's just finding an exception. But nonetheless, you know, the feeling is, hey, the trustee doesn't have to show a lot. And I've got to prove um, uh, that uh, I should be exempted from those laws and the trustee should have more of a burden. Well, I have a couple of cases. One is uh, basically an example of the trustee's burden. The trustee does have a burden of proving um, uh, the elements that he needs to prove. The case is Shapiro versus Art Leather out of Michigan. In this case, uh, which by the way, um, apparently was a pretty big case, 3.2 million, and uh, had a trial of about seven days. And an obviously angry judge uh, dismissed the trustee's case in front of the defendant. Why? One of the elements the trustee had to prove was 547b5, which we'll go into later, essentially showing that the, um, the debtor was uh, insolvent at the time of the transfer. The trustee had an expert and the expert did not do any independent research. So just relied on the trustee's statements. And the judge found that the expert was not a credible witness and uh, found that there was just uh, uh, not enough evidence for the trustee to prove element, uh, element 547b5. So the trustee, I'm sorry, the judge uh, dismissed the case. Just an example that the trustee does have a burden of proving the elements and in this case, uh, did not meet that burden. This came straight from the opinion. Basically, it shows the missing uh, facts uh, in the uh, in the trustee's case. You can see at the bottom it says total unsecured claims unknown, but at least. 3 million and change distribution on secure creditors unknown, but maybe a hundred, maybe a hundred percent. So basically summarizes that the, uh, that the trustees expert was unable to show that the debtor, uh, was insolvent. Well, What's more relevant most of the time, if not, I want to say all the time, but what's, what's more relevant a lot of the time is the defendant's burden of proving the defenses um, to, uh, to an avoidance action brought by the trustee. Mangan versus Clark Farms, uh, case out of Connecticut. It's a recent case and uh, is an example, but there are tons and tons and tons and tons of examples that defendants just did not meet, uh, uh, just did not meet uh, uh, their burden of showing defenses. This is one of those, what were they possibly thinking kind of cases. This was a $16,000 and change case and it was obviously litigated and the defendant Failed to show anything. It, it claimed a contemporaneous exchange defense uh, when there was an 18 day lapse in payment, which is a lot of time. We'll go into the contemporaneous exchange defense later. Didn't show any new value. And since this was a single transaction between the parts, didn't show, uh, there is a way of showing ordinary course, potentially, even though there's a single transaction, but apparently uh, the defendant didn't show uh, any evidence at all. So, in a small case like this, it was just apparently uh, a waste of attorney fees and a waste of judicial time. And I'm sure uh, the judge felt that and uh, the anger uh, <laughs> shines through the opinion. 
not a happy result for the defendant here. Jurisdiction uh, of the bankruptcy court uh, comes up a lot in uh, in preference cases and also in fraudulent conveyance cases. Uh, for our purposes, what we're going to focus on is um, the issue of when a preference defendant is located very far from the bankruptcy court. This happens all the time. Uh, and uh, defendants are extremely bitter that a bankruptcy could be filed in Delaware and uh, they're located in California and they've got to deal with this. So I'm going to go into uh, a specific case here that deals with this issue. Okay, this is a Massachusetts case. Now, this is a very early case, but I think it, it's pretty illustrative of the bankruptcy court's jurisdiction. Uh, the preference defendant in this case was a, uh, a resident of Rhode Island. So it's a fairly complicated proceeding, but essentially this was uh, the preference defendant in this case put a lien on the debtor's assets and the trustee sought to avoid the lien as a preference. This is one of those, what was he thinking kind of cases because the defendant's attorney argued that um, under state law jurisdictional principles, um, the bankruptcy court didn't have any jurisdiction over the defendant in Rhode Island because it didn't, because it failed to establish that the defendant had minimum contacts using uh, Massachusetts long arm statute with the state of Massachusetts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this did not succeed. Um, and the bankruptcy code spells out that uh, federal jurisdiction applies in the context of a bankruptcy case and state law jurisdiction uh, is irrelevant. 1471 controls the jurisdiction of the bankruptcy court. Bankruptcy court does not have to look at a Massachusetts uh, long arm statute. 1471 is the basic jurisdictional provision um, of, the, uh, of the bankruptcy laws. And, and what it says is that the district courts, and by reference, the bankruptcy courts shall have original and exclusive jurisdiction of all cases under Title 11. Well, that summarizes that. It's just important to know that uh, state law uh, jurisdictional principles are, supersede, are superseded by federal jurisdictional principles. And the bankruptcy court has jurisdiction over parties and property anywhere in the country. Well, what about, what about a foreign company with no contacts um, with the U.S. Or, or insufficient contacts to give jurisdiction uh, in the U.S.? What happens there? This was a Canadian corporation. Um, had uh, no business installations or employees in the U.S. Uh, but this is one of those uh, gotcha principles. Uh, the corporation filed a proof of claim. Uh, it's important to know, it's very, very important to know, that if you file a proof of claim with the bankruptcy court, um, the bankruptcy court will have jurisdiction over you. Why? Because you've consented to jurisdiction. It's a very important principle. So once you file a proof of claim, uh, it changes the ball game as far as jurisdiction goes. The theory is at the bottom of this slide. The creditor cannot reasonably expect to invoke those portions of the bankruptcy code that allows it to recover on its claim and yet avo avoid the legal effect of other sections. Um, I don't know. That's the law. But a lot of times, you know, companies will file claims routinely and not know that they're going to be sued for a preference. 
a couple of years later or a year later. To me, it, it, does, it doesn't seem very fair, but that's what it is. Your Honor, with all respect, we concede jurisdiction, but Your Honor, we're in California. Uh, we did business with the debtor in California. It's not fair for us to schlep all the way to New York for this case. Uh, at the very least, it should be transferred to a federal bankruptcy court in uh, California. Well, this argument, in my experience, usually fails. And there are a ton of cases denying change in venue. Uh, this, is, this is just one example. I mean, basically, it's, you know, the, the judge has a laundry list of uh, things to look at to decide whether it would be appropriate to change venue. And somehow, uh, the laundry list always seems to favor the debtor. Marco is uh, a relatively small case. The United States is about 20,000. Defendant is in Eastern District, New York, and the, uh, the debtor is in Delaware. So the defendant argues uh, that venue is improper um, and that the case should be uh, transferred to, uh, to New York. It sets out some of the arguments and counter arguments. But what's interesting about this case is it's pretty typical. It's a small preference case, 20K is not a lot of money to litigate anything. And the defendant is in Long Island or wherever he is in, in Eastern District, New York. The case is filed in Delaware. He's gonna have to hire a, a lawyer in Delaware. If there's a trial, he's gonna have to go to Delaware. If there are depositions, he may have to go to Delaware. And uh, the entire claim amount is gonna be siphoned off by uh, the cost of, of fighting a case in a foreign jurisdiction. So of course, the defendant uh, made the motion to change venue. The problem is that judges don't want to change uh, venue. And, and why is that? Well, this is the laundry list that they look at. But realistically, uh, debtors are suing defendants all over the country for uh, relatively small amounts, 20,000, 25,000, 30,000. If the, if the debtor had to bring these suits uh, in the jurisdictions next to the area where the defendants resided or had businesses, uh, it would be impossible to pursue these cases. It would be way too expensive. Um, so courts almost always find in favor of the debtor on, on the venue argument, because otherwise you might as well just take out uh, Section 547 or limit it to cases uh, well over 100K, because the debtor would never be able to afford to bring them. Well, this summarizes the decision, uh, not surprisingly, transfer of venue is unwarranted. Uh, essentially, these, these motions are usually a waste of time and money. What you need to know about uh, from this is just that there's a two year statute of limitations Trustee had, or trustee or whoever's bringing the preference action, credit, creditors committee, has uh, two years from the order of relief, uh, so from the petition date, or one year from when the first trustee was appointed. Typically, it's two years. I don't see this issue coming up a lot, probably because if a trust if a trustee is appointed, it's usually within the first year of the Chapter Eleven case, but the statute of limitations could run over two years from the petition date. If the first trustee, uh, and it only applies to the first trustee, uh, was appointed uh, later in the case.